Plays two, volume two, eight plays in total, seven of which saw audiences. The first, Harry's Dream, written in 1997, uh, and looks at bullying and violence in schools. Researched and written in late 96, 97, early 97, with the help of Dave Smith, child psychologist for Durham County Schools. Harry's Dream went on to be performed approximately 200 times in primary, junior schools, middle and some secondary schools in the northeast of England between February 1997 and October 1999. Each performance also featured a short workshop in which children were asked to comment on what they saw and bullying they'd experienced themselves, and then a short scene was recreated in which the participants were empowered with their various legal and moral options. Set in an open space, the show is played on the floor or on the same level as the seated audience, not on a stage. The set should be portable and bright and not rely on lights or sound, but should also have a hidden backstage area for actors and a lightweight but robust looking wall about waist high. The actors playing Tom and or Mr Black operate the puppets. The show can be played by adults and children and can also be used as a reading or study piece. The cast for the original performance was myself as Killer, Tom and Mr Black, Lawrence Guasso as the Green Girl and Tony Hindho as Harry. Throughout the play, it may be necessary to change the names of some contemporary cultural and sporting icons as these names change with the times. And the cast was Harry, the hero, a sensitive, bright boy of 11 years old. Tom, Harry's friend, also 11, but more robust in character than Harry. Killer, real name Peter Jones, also 11, the school bully. Mr Black, mid-30s. A kind but strict teacher, over-concerned with his own authority more than his ability to relate to his pupils. And Janet, uh, 11 years old, an alien girl, confident and assertive. The next play was My Brother Jake. My Brother Jake was written in the summer of 1997 and first performed on Tuesday 14th of October 1997 at the DLI Gallery in Durham City, researched using source materials then available for secondary schools and with the help of a Middlesbrough police officer. Thinking at that time was aimed at primarily informing young people and accepting that if they persisted in risk-taking behaviour then at least they'd be educated to consequences. The original cast was Tony Hindho as Mark, Adrian Morgan and then Simon Gibson as Jake, Tony Stowers, myself, as the police constable and Laurence Guasso as Mam, the doctor and Mrs C. The show was performed 35 times over two years. Uh, the daddy character which exists was added after a rewrite uh, and the cast was Mark 14, Jake 17, Mam 35, constable 35, doctor 30, Mrs C 40 and the daddy at 30. After that, the next play was Colours. Colours was written in 1999 as a result of the evidence of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. Uh, I felt compelled to address the issue as best as I could. It reads as a story, but just as much as a one-man show, which was the intention. The workshop that came with it helped me develop ideas for a very successful improvised show, 101 performances in two years, which I later devised in 2003 called Monsieur Gaston, French Shopkeeper. Colours was performed in around 20 primary schools at the time. Uh, the next was Harry's Dream 2. Harry's Dream 2 was written in 1998, a year after the success of Harry's Dream 1, to continue to reinforce the themes of stopping bullying in schools using the same characters but with a different story. It was per first performed on the 2nd of April 1998 and then another 30 times to primary schools, most of which or most of whom had seen the first play. Uh, and the cast then was Harry was played by again by Tony Hindhoe, Janet 
and another character called Peter was played by Lawrence Quasso, and I played the old man. Uh, the next play was Scars. Scars was written in 1998 to explore problems that some secondary schools in North East England were having with school uh, with transport vandalism. The funding application was successful because I argued that the newspaper article that featured this problem was unlikely to be read by the target audience it was aimed at, and that a strong theatre performance for schools where the problem was relevant could be more effective. On procuring the real-life list of events from the authorities, the story wrote itself very quickly, as I too had been a vandal as a teenager and had a stored backlog of experience to explore. It is argued that vandalism is an, ex <coughs> is an expression of attention-seeking because although destroying something is dangerous, wasteful and risky, the consequences can change behaviour. And to a vandal, it is the fact that their actions have this indirect influence that makes the risk worthwhile. The notion that they are responsible for that change in behaviour of other people. For example, writing something offensive on a public wall means passers-by will be shocked. And it's the ability to provoke that shock that satisfies the demand for attention that a vandal often seeks. The props for the show were two used bus seats taken from an old bus in a breaker's yard in County Durham. The cast of the play was first Carl Moppet and then Mark Orton as Michael, Tony Hindhoe as Brian, Helen Young Husband as Angela, Lawrence Guasso as Mum and Doctor, and myself as Driver and the English teacher Zed. Uh, after Scars came Eddie. Eddie is one of my favourite plays. I wrote it in 1999 in anticipation of selling it to primary schools to celebrate the arrival of the year 2000. Looking back at the achievements of both ordinary people and the wider world throughout the course of at least two-thirds of the 20th century. There's so much in Eddie that comes out of my own family history. My granddad was a miner in a small village in County Durham, and his memoirs served the story up until the late 1950s. Then my own father and mother's stories filter in, until finally, in the 1970s onwards, my own memories take over. Before my granddad died in the late 1990s, I asked him to write down as much as he could remember of those days. I hope I've done him proud to remember his life in this play. Eddie's great-grandson, Bruce, plays the questioning role of the young audience that I, I would have expected to have watching the show. Although I'm the first to admit that the script lacks drama, movement and action, I think the little drama and action that is possible within that real time frame and that, lo and that location is subtle, gentle and lyrical. I wanted it to be poignant and thought provoking, where the focus is on history. We don't always have to hit young people with high energy action to get their attention. If we think that, then we do their intelligence a disservice. Uh, then there was Serrano, which was, well, I read it. Serrano, <clears throat> adapted from Serrano de Bergerac by Edmund Rostin and Steve Martin's film Roxanne. Serrano was a deliberate choice to mix together elements from both the original play and Steve Martin's film Roxanne and relocate and update it, it was written in the year 2000, and regionalise it. Uh, some of the language and lines, yes, regionalise some of the language and lines to a fictional ex-pit village in North East England. It was largely produced for rural touring and small to mid-scale venues, village halls for example, so I felt it needed to retain a flexible family comedy feel. I stirred in some of my own poetry, a voiceover, and contemporary references to the legendary, legendary recovery by Manchester United against Bayern Munich in the Champions League Cup final in 1999. Also, the use of mobile phones to accomplish certain dramatic effects and the insertion of classic pop music tracks. In the first experimental tour in the autumn of 2000, I directed, and the cast was David Napthine as Serrano, Tony Hindhoe as Mr. Digweed, Eleanor Crawford as Roxy, and Mark Orton as Chris. In the second tour in the summer of 2001, the cast was the same, except I played Serrano and Philip Parr directed. We took around £12,000 in public funding 
to enable us to play in the UK and also in, in France. It was performed 19 times in total. Uh, and the last play in this volume is The Key, 1999. The Key was written in 1999 as a response to a commission by Darlington Borough Council to create theatre for primary age school children that introduced them to the existence of household legal drugs. I'd seen an article in a local newspaper stating that the Education Authority intended to pursue a programme via kid-friendly literature to address the adult area of legal drugs, aspirin, alcohol, cigarettes, and illegal drugs, dope, cocaine, and heroin, by first recognising and then trying to categorise them. My creative approach was to look at the life of a young boy with a dubious decision-making process who flirts with this dangerous world through the use of poetry based on a simple ABCB rhyming scheme composed of four-syllable lines where possible to create a sing-song ear-friendly pattern similar to a nursery rhyme. The only weak point in the show was the set. I can only put it down to inexperience at that time. Using a one-dimensional rigid set with a door for the first tour and on the second discarding the set and retaining only the door, we performed the play in two different ways. The door became the true metaphor for the world we live in, and the key that opened that door represented the knowledge we have and how we use it. Despite overall negative feedback, feedback from Darlington Borough Council, who I think expected far too much from it, the responses from schools were very supportive. Uh, I doubt it'll be performed again, but a lot of time went into the writing of the verse. So I think it deserves a place here. Volume 2, 8 plays. 